If the stock market has been a road to wealth over the last decade, Kevin Bradley was in the fast lane. What, what, are, you, what are you focusing in on? So for example, but on his way to the office every day, he began to talk to the homeless people who approached him for money. He became determined to give them more than that. Um, that's when I realized, you know, here's a gap here. There's a hole. There's a need. And that is somebody needs to come along and provide some exit ramps out of this thing called poverty. Bradley created a nonprofit in Baltimore to teach job skills to the homeless. But he and his family soon found out that trading life on Wall Street for the simple life wasn't so simple. Logistically, how do you go from making six figures to making under $10,000 a year? How do, you, how do you make that kind of adjustment? Our family was growing and, and, and the, the resources weren't there. So it was a difficult transition uh, to make. So difficult, in fact, that Kevin and his wife Marilyn began to learn firsthand what it meant to go from having it all to being have not. I remember I came home from work and Marilyn met me at the door and we had uh, our two oldest sons, Todd and Mark at that time, and she said, you know, honey, we don't have any food. And I'm like, no problem, I'll just go to the store and buy some. She says, no, we, we don't have any money. Kevin Bradley ended up having to get food out of the food pantry he had set aside for the homeless. It was just the beginning. There was a seven-year stretch where my wife and I didn't buy any new clothes. We just have decided that because of what Kevin does, we have had to take sacrifices. But the blessings that we have gotten from him doing what he does far outweigh the fact that, you know, the boys don't walk around in old Navy shirts all the time. Here we go. What's important for us is not the boats or the... The, you know, the new houses or anything like that. It really comes down to real quality time with the kids and with each other. It often takes courage in our society to give up materialism. The more possibilities in your future, the more courage. Cory Booker is a Rhodes Scholar and Ivy League educated attorney. The kind of background that often leads to a big house in an exclusive suburb. It was uh, not the, the path I wanted to do. I, I originally had this vision that I was going to start a nonprofit in the city of Newark, working with young people and getting them invo involved in legal activism. His desire to help people in the inner city led him to become a city councilman in Newark, New Jersey. And while um, I, I think that you should always be hungering for more, that hunger should really be uh, more knowledge, more understanding, more spiritual strength. Um, and not necessarily more material things. Booker has even gone so far as to live in these housing projects here in the New Jersey district he represents, all part of his effort to simplify his life. Researchers say more and more people are choosing personal fulfillment over a hefty paycheck. People with so much more money and all the good things it buys are a little bit less happy today, the social fabric is weaker, and thus we're beginning to question this materialistic American dream, and beginning to dream, I think, a new American dream, appropriate for a new century. Social psychologist David Myers has written a couple of books on the subject. Some social scientists are seeing the beginnings of what they call post-materialism, that is, people's beginning to question whether the materialistic idea of the accumulating money and the toys that it buys really does bring the good life, or whether the good life comes instead from developing close, supportive, self-disclosing, committed relationships, and from having a deep spiritual sense of purpose. That search for purpose led a Stanford University dean to give up his position and become a priest. Can't find a much simpler lifestyle than that. What most people focus on, I think, is what I'm giving up, which is a wonderful job in a wonderful place, working with fabulous people and some of the brightest students in the world. But uh, what I've always said is that what I'm going to do is just as much uh, a wonderful experience and an important thing. And perhaps for me, that's more important. In this new American dream, it seems the things that matter most don't carry a price tag for people willing to let go of ego and possessions and truly redefine their lives. Karen Jordan, Odyssey Weekly. Jesus was the little children All the little children of the world Red, yellow, yellow black, black, and white were all precious in his sight. And Johnny Lee Clary remembers singing that song as a child in Sunday school until he was taught a different view of the world. I went home and sang that for my father and I found myself in another church right after that. Clary's father taught him to hate anyone 
who didn't look like him. The very first time I ever seen a black person, I was five years old, and we were sitting in front of a grocery store, and I seen the black man walking by carrying his groceries. And I said, look, Daddy, there's a chocolate-covered man. And uh, my father, he taught me to call that man the N-word. His father committed suicide when Clary was just 11 years old. He was left feeling unloved and alone. I was watching David Duke on television one day, and he was talking about the Ku Klux Klan. And when I heard the word KKK, I remembered my uncle in Georgia, and, and I remembered my dad and him talking about it. So I, sat, I listened to him, then I sat down when he gave the address out, and I wrote him for information. And he sent me a big, huge packet full of Klan literature. At 14, he totally embraced the world of the KKK. Being a Klansman gave him a sense of belonging he'd never had. I guess back then it was a big deal to me because uh, I had looked at the Klan as some kind of a hero, you know, organization. And so uh, when I first put on the robe and the hood, I felt kind of a sense of power. He rose in the ranks and later became Grand Dragon of the state of Oklahoma. He routinely expressed his views on inflammatory broadcasts. During one encounter at a radio station, he was matched against Reverend Wade Watts. I figured he would come in and uh, flash a switchblade at me and say, I'm going to cut me a white boy. And uh, that's what I was expecting. And I, wasn't, I, was, I was really shocked when this man walked in wearing a suit and a tie. And the only weapon he bought with him was the Holy Bible in his hand. He and other Klan members threatened Watts and later burned down his church. But Watts refused to give in to hate. The more Clary saw this, the more he began to feel that perhaps he was wrong. Deep down inside, I didn't really like having to hate people. The hatred turned inward and brought Clary to the brink of suicide 10 years ago. At that moment, he experienced a religious epiphany. You don't just say a prayer and all that prejudice and hate leave, you know. I still had all the prejudice in me, you know. Uh, but it's like Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Giving up a lifetime of bigotry wasn't simple. It took one man to change Johnny Lee Clary, just as it took one man to change Larry Jeans. He resented white people and could not see them as individuals. I took everything that happened to me personal. Um, I've been stopped by the police for just driving while black. Um, I've been stopped and given tickets for things I know, you know, that I, I didn't do, but if I go to court, the judge is not going to, you know, believe my side of the story. But later, he learned a different perspective. It took the efforts of one particular white man who didn't have to help me at all, who allowed me to, uh, who found actually thousands of dollars for me to actually attend college uh, my second year, for me to realize that I've been putting up a roadblock and for me to actually stop and think about the belief system that I developed. It's hard giving up any deeply entrenched opinion. Even subtle prejudice is hard to give up because we simply don't recognize it in ourselves very easily. The first step and the most important one, and I think the hardest one, is for white folks to recognize that racism is our issue. It isn't just something black folks need to deal with, that brown folks need to deal with, but it is something that we have to deal with because it was set up for us. I want to continue to do everything I can to bring the different races around the world together to help tear down these walls of hatred, to help tear down these walls of, of division. Clary has founded a ministry that promotes racial reconciliation and travels the world preaching it. He now receives threats from the KKK. He understands exactly where they're coming from and treats them with the same compassion that Reverend Watts showed him. Karen Jordan, Odyssey Weekly. This job is about to be open. We are grateful that we can learn from each other. Lutheran Minister James Ford is retiring after 20 years as chaplain of the House of Representatives. It is not a simple transition. People across the country must be looking at us and thinking, it comes to the selection of a House chaplain, and they can't even do that? Eshoo was on a House committee that was to choose the new chaplain. There were nine Democrats and nine Republicans. They favored Father Timothy O'Brien, a Catholic priest who heads Marquette University's Washington program. But the House leadership, Speaker Hastert, Majority Leader Army, and Minority Leader Gephardt, rejected the committee's recommendation in favor of a Presbyterian minister, Reverend Charles Wright. Committee member Eshoo, a Catholic, speaks for many in the House who think this looks like bias. Anyone can take me on here in this institution 
uh, with what they may term as my democratic ideas. But don't come after my faith. Critics say Hastert and Army have not adequately explained why they rejected the committee's recommendation. The decision angers others outside the House. Catholic League President William Donahue said, both Hastert and Army need to explain why they could not in good conscience vote for Father O'Brien, knowing that he was the only candidate who received a majority of the votes from both parties. The House Speaker's press secretary is speaking for him on this. I'm Irish Catholic. I think anti-Catholic bias is wrong. Um, and I don't think, I know that Denny Hastert and Dick Army don't have an anti-Catholic bone in their body. He says the leaders simply feel more comfortable with Reverend Wright as a person. The speaker was trying to get the best person for the job, notwithstanding whatever religious affiliation uh, the different candidates were. History also favors the Presbyterian candidate. No Catholic has ever served as House Chaplain since the position was first created in 1789. The chaplain is in charge of overseeing daily prayers as well as counseling House members and their families. The position also pays well, about $132,000 a year. The committee that recommended Father O'Brien was overwhelmingly Protestant. I think if individuals feel that a member of their religious tradition or a, a clergy of their faith you know, cannot be a U.S. House chaplain because of the actions of one particular political party, they may not reward that party with their votes in November. In this election year, this issue is not promoting the spirit of fellowship in the U.S. House of Representatives. Karen Jordan, News Odyssey.